Hi there. Super glad to see you guys today. Um, this is a time that you're going to be able to ask your questions. So I'm sure as a parent going through this special ed process has sometimes been exhilarating, oftentimes frustrating, sometimes overwhelming. So I wanted to dedicate this show just to your questions. So if you have those burning questions about uh, how can we make next year go more smoothly or my child isn't getting enough support from the therapist at school, whatever your questions are, jump in, say hi, and we're going to tackle them today. So if I haven't met you before, I'm Charmaine Tanner. I founded an advocacy agency called Collaborative Special Education Advocacy. And my passion as a parent and as a retired teacher is to help other parents be empowered so they can be even more effective advocates for their kiddos. So today's about your questions. So I'll be looking at my phone often to see what comments and questions we have. But I also wanted to show you that I brought some of my tools today. Um, I think as an advocate, it's always a good idea to be a detective. I think probably detective skills are going to be the ones that help you the most. Um, a lot of times we have to be a detective and figure out what that data means that they show to us at IEP meetings, or we have to be a detective and figure out what's going well at school, what's not working, what we can make adjustments with. So if we need our magnifying glass today to be a detective, we've got it. Now the other thing that um, sometimes <laughs> it doesn't seem like I can use often enough is my easy button. So if we come up with some great ideas today and you're like, yay, that's gonna work for me. That was easy then we get to press the easy button. Now, sometimes it's like, I don't know, I wish I had a magic ball or a magic wand, a crystal ball, I guess it is, or a magic wand. Um, today I have the magic eight ball with me. Now, if you remember eight balls from your childhood, type yes in the comment box. Um, so sometimes when we don't know the answer, it's like, well, I don't know. Do I get a fortune cookie and figure it out? Do I turn to my magic eight ball? But today, we're hoping that between you and I, we can figure out some things that have been bugging you and make things better, even if it's just for summer ideas. Um, so jump in, join the conversation. This is meant to be interactive, not just me um, talking with you. So I'm going to check my Facebook page right now and see how we're going because I'd love to see that first person in with a question. Um, I know that there was one mom, um, Keely, and she said she was going to be driving at this time, but she'd be listening to us on her phone. So if you're here listening, <laughs> hey there, Keely. Um, she also sent in a question or a comment about her son's school, and he's 10 years old. He is going part-time to a special ed school. It sounds like mainly for students with autism or on the autism spectrum. And she's just kind of a little anxious, a little worried. His um, IEP is coming up and they're going to be talking about the next school year. So actually she was one of our lucky people and she um, responded to my Facebook announcement and she actually won a free 45 minute phone consultation with me. So because she's driving, we won't be able to have a conversation today about her question, but um, Keely, make sure that you get in touch with me and we'll schedule that 45 minute free phone consultation. So I see we have a couple people. Shirley Swope is here. Shirley, how are you? Shirley's a wonderful parent advisor in Colorado. She works for Peak Parent Center. So a shout out to Peak. 
And um, Shirley, I don't know if you saw at the beginning, but I do have my advocacy tools. I have my magnifying glass so we can be better detectives. I have my easy button when we come up with an easy solution. That was easy. Or if we need to, Shirley, I've got a magic eight ball. Because you know, every good parent advisor should have a magic eight ball, right? It says fantastic. So let's dive into some questions. So I see we have a comment here. So let me. All right. Oops, I gotta fantastic. turn this down. And Shirley says she's fine, and Erica's here. Yay! Um, I yesterday I did a, a short video about our announcement, and I asked people to give an extra shout out to Erica, who's going through some really. Uh, stressful times with the school district and I've been helping her for the past couple years so if you can um, click on the heart and that will be giving Erica some extra love today that would be awesome I do have some questions that people sent in um, they weren't able to be here live so let's go into those questions until we get a question from you so the first question is, how do I help teachers have higher expectations for my child? So, does this sound familiar to you? If it does, type yes in the comment box. Higher expectations. And I just, you know, I sometimes I just wonder, I'm not sure why this can be a common concern for so many families because, you know, I'm not sure. Sometimes we hear from teachers at IEP meetings, well, I want to make sure that your child's successful, so we're going to set the goal at a place where we think you really can meet that goal. But, you know, sometimes it just feels like we're taking the easy way out. <laughs> So instead, I mean, I want to make sure that your child has those high expectations put on him by the school and by yourself, because that's when we see our kids really achieve. So if the occupational therapist is saying, I'm only going to see your child for 15 minutes a week because we're only going to work on this, and I think this is all that he, you know, we're going to expect for the next year. I would ask you to call a time out during the IEP meeting and just say, let's have more of a conversation about this. Um, if we're really looking at planning for a whole year from now, I know you want to be realistic, but I also want to make sure that our expectations are high enough that my child's actually going to be achieving more in that year. Um, I did a previous video a, a couple months ago about the new Supreme Court decision in the Andrew F. versus Douglas County court case. And it, Chief Justice Roberts, you know, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, reiterated how we need to have ambitious goals for our students. So, you know, just based on that premise and also what we know as parents in our gut is that we do want teachers to have higher expectations. Sometimes it's helpful as a parent if you can videotape what your child's doing at home and bring it in and show it to them. It doesn't have to be at the IEP meeting. It could be at an informal parent-teacher meeting. Um, I know that's been effective for some parents because Often when we go to meetings and we'll say, wow, you, you know, at home he's doing X, Y, Z, and I don't see any of that at school, and the teachers kind of roll their eyes, and it's like, oh, this parent's in denial. And it's like, no, really, he's able to do that when we sit down together at home. So grab your cell phone, make a short video, and show them how you're working with your child and how... You know, you're able to get that kind of academic skill or whatever from him. Um, but it is super, super important to make sure that everybody has high expectations. Sometimes I think it comes from um, 
not understanding exactly what your child's strengths are or what their interests are. So that is something that um, is super important. That is a, a thread through all my advocacy work is to make sure that you share as a parent what your child's strengths and interests are. And then that will give them some ideas of like, wow, I didn't even think of that. I could be doing this. We could be helping him learn how to, you know, do more math skills if we tie it into soccer scores and figuring that out, whatever the case can be. But try to think of a variety of ways that you can show the teachers what your child already knows Maybe the private therapist could connect with the school therapist and say, you know, in therapy session, we know it's not a school setting, but this is what we're working on, and this has been real helpful for us. So maybe try that in the school too. So let me check in here. So Shirley and Erica are saying yes, absolutely. So Erica, I know we talk almost every day, but if you have a new question, you can type it in. And Shirley, I know as a parent advisor, um, you get questions asked of you every day. So if you have some other tips and strategies about high expectations or any other questions that we deal with today, Shirley, please type them in the comments and I'll make sure that we um, Read that out loud so everybody can share because Shirley is like uh, kind of the, I don't know, the ninja parent advisor. <laughs> I mean, she's like full of wisdom and um, just an incredible person. So I'm excited she's with us today. And Erica is a super mom that is just like traveling down that advocacy path like nobody else. And... Um, so I'm super excited that you guys are here today. Now let's look at another question that came in earlier. And this is from a mom who said, how can we keep the IEP meeting on track? The meeting always seems to stay, or I think that was supposed to be stray, stray all over the place. Well, if you've been to those meetings where it just gets kind of scattered and people kind of lose the direction, you know that that can be really frustrating because you only have a certain amount of time for the meeting. A lot of times that's an hour and you want to make sure you make the most of that time. Now, the other tip I always share with parents is don't feel pressured if that hour block of time isn't enough. Just ask to have the meeting rescheduled. Um, you don't have to push everything into that one block of time. But we do want to make it efficient. So if the school doesn't typically have an agenda for IEP meetings as a parent, that's something that you could suggest. Um, and I would, I would do that ahead of time. So if you know kind of from previous experience that they don't come in with an agenda, the meeting just gets, you know, scrambled and everybody's off in different directions. I would just call or, you know, sit down with the special ed teacher and say, you know, I'm sure we all want to make sure we're efficient. Could you and I just take a couple minutes and brainstorm some of the specific things that we want to cover? and just have an agenda that we can use at the IEP meeting. Now, I think the best way is if we can help the teacher or the staff feel like it was their idea or they're going to bring the agenda to the table. Um, so even though you're sitting down together and having that conversation, you might see if the special ed teacher will actually be the one that takes the notes and writes down the different topics and the order that they're going to be discussed and say, you know, could you just print this up and have copies for us at the meeting? Um, that gives the special ed teacher some empowerment that, you know, she's going to be the one passing out the agenda um, and she's going to be kind of the hero because People are going to be excited like, ah, we finally got a track here that we're going to go on. Um, so I think agendas really help us, you know, stay on track. 
The other thing is sometimes even with an agenda, you know, people will kind of get off into these side conversations or whatever. Um, if in your state you have facilitators that can help with IEP meetings, that could be something that you request. Um, I know in Colorado where Shirley is that they've just um, initiated and trained some people to be facilitators. So that option is available in most states. Um, I'm living in Idaho now and Idaho has facilitators and sometimes having that neutral person to help guide the process. They don't get involved with the content, but they guide the process can be helpful. Um, another thing you can do is assign somebody at the IEP meeting to be the timekeeper and kind of keep people on pace that way. So look at um, kind of effective meeting strategies that people use in the business world and employ that when you have your IEP meetings. Because as we know, going to an IEP meeting is going to a business meeting. Um, and so those might be some strategies that you could try. So I'm seeing some likes and I'm going to send out a heart to make sure Erica knows <laughs> that we're thinking of her with all this stuff going on. And Shirley says she's fine. I see we have some other people here. Amanda, yay! Amanda used to live in Colorado and now she lives in Virginia and she just shared the video. So that's something you can do too is just on your Facebook page click on share share this video to your own page and um, more parents will make it in here and Marlo she says hi I finally made it <laughs> so hey to you I'm glad you're here today um, I feel like we're kind of developing this little community when we go on Facebook live which makes me so excited because my whole goal is to support you as parents, so I'm super excited when we get people to share the time with us and be here. So if you guys have a question, make sure you type it in because um, that way we can be answering specific things that apply to you and apply to your child. And Shirley just shared the video, so hey Shirley, thank you. And Amanda, if you have a question, make sure you type it in. Um, Amanda's doing some advocacy work in Virginia, and she's just another incredible mom. And so it's so, like, I don't know, like exciting for me that I have parents that I have worked with and now I see them going on and being advocates for other parents. And that's what we want. We want to spread the news, spread the strategies because the more parents learn, the more parents know about these new tools and ways of doing things, the better it's gonna be for our kids. And that's, that's what we want, right? That's the payoff. So I'm excited today. Our third question that came in earlier and this is a good one it says what can we do to make sure the school board knows what's going on in our district so um, Erica I was thinking of you because Erica had emailed me last night and said "Ooh, did you hear the news one of our school districts here around uh, nearby us got some new board of trustees and so that's an opportunity to start making some new relationships and you know the school board is empowered to look at the whole, the district as a whole and they keep that big picture in mind and they don't want to be you know micromanaging things um, so they don't want to micromanage a special ed director or the building principal or a special ed teacher however i think it's critical that the school board have a big picture of what's going on in special education and education in their district. So one of the things that I encourage parents to do is 
to go to school board meetings. It's like, yay, that's all I need is another meeting on my calendar, Charmaine. But if you can form a group of parents and you can take turns, so you don't go to every meeting, you know, 12 months out of the year, but instead, if you had six parents, each of you would pick two months to go to the school board meeting. And you would be amazed how much impact you sitting, just sitting in the audience and not even asking a question has. Because typically at school board meetings, the only people that are sitting in the audience are people who are required to go, like building principals or special ed directors or things like that. So when somebody new comes to a school board meeting and they sit in the audience, they're like, wow, who's that? I wonder, you know, they get a little nervous. It's like, is somebody going to have something to complain about? Because usually people only go if, right, if things aren't going well. But instead, you make it a, a conscious choice to go to school board meetings. Like I said, share that wealth with other parents. And before and after the school board meeting, just go up to a couple of the school board members and say, I just wanted to introduce, you, uh, introduce myself. Um, I'm a parent in the district. My son or daughter receives special ed services. But I'm also interested in just the district as a whole and how things are going for our kids. So I'm just going to be bopping in and, and coming to some of the meetings. Now, just that, that's going to be your initial start to forming relationships. Because I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but to me, the three R's of advocacy are relationships, relationships, relationships. So school board members are the same. We have to form some relationships with them before we come, you know, demanding some change or outrage because of what's happening. Um, so I encourage you to start forming those relationships. You can bring your son or daughter with you to the meeting, you know, depending on, you know, the age of your son or daughter. They they need to see you as a person. They need to see your child as a person. Um, they need to know you are, you know, the community is the one that elected the school board members. They work for you. You need to share with them what's going on in your child's life at school. And one of the ways that you can do that is just showing up for different activities. Um, you can also, if you have a specific question, usually there's a procedure at school board members and you can sign up on the clipboard before the meeting to say, you know, they'll ask for your name and sometimes your email. They might ask what topic you want to, you know, speak about. You usually only have a two or three minute time period, so you want to be real, um, you know, make sure that you've got some notes ahead of time or whatever for your question because you don't want to ramble on. You need to be, you know, within their time frame. But I I think, you know, when the time is right, you can go and, you know, sign up, speak in front of the board and say, you know, this is a topic of interest for me. I wanted to give you a little bit of background. I always think it's good to end your time making the statement to the board to ask a question. Now, usually they're pretty savvy <laughs> and they'll say, thank you, um, we won't be responding in public right now, but we appreciate your opinion or whatever. But sometimes you're lucky and you'll get a school board member that will actually answer your question at the board meeting. Um, so those are some tips that I have. Start out building relationships and then bring your child, speak up at a board meeting, go to different activities so you can get to know those people that are serving you. That you are the, you know, you are the community that they are supposed to be responding to. So let me check here. So I see... Let's see, uh, Lynn, hey, <laughs> this must be a Colorado day. Lynn from Colorado is, she was an awesome teacher and then became an awesome administrator. She was a principal 
um, in a school district and has since retired, but Lynn is one of those uh, school administrators that you would love to clone because she always makes decisions based on what's good for kids. So, hey, Lynn, I'm glad you're here with us. And, you know, just like the other parents, I think we all have a variety of experiences. So, um, Erica, I don't know if you want to type in the comments. I know you've made some contact um, recently to school board members. If you want to share with parents like what you did, um, I don't want to speak for you, but if you feel comfortable sharing um, some of the strategies that you've used recently, that would be good. Oh, and I see here, Erica. So she wrote, grievance letters work amazing, thought I would share. Yes, thanks, Erica. Yeah, she's had some pretty, um, I don't know, kind of unbelievable situations happening. And so what Erica did is she put together a wonderful letter that described the background of what's been happening to her son, um, the concerns that she's had, what ways she's tried to resolve the issues. And now she's at the point where it's like, I need some, you know, some support or some help from a district level um, position or person. So she's used her grievance letter and she sent it to the school board. And so we're waiting. I don't think, Erica, you've gotten a response yet because you just did that, but let me know in the comments um, if you've gotten a response back from them. So, yeah. But let's go on. I have another question because I asked people if they couldn't be here live, they could submit their questions. So we do have another one. And this is from, this was actually from a dad that wrote to me and he said, I'm tired of not being heard at IEP meetings. Everything is predetermined. How do I even have any hope that next year will be different? So if this sounds familiar to you, type yes in the comment box or give us a like. You know, it can be frustrating, I think, to go to any meeting and you feel like your input is just token input. And it doesn't matter what you say. I mean, this could be at a meeting for your homeowners association. It could be a Kiwanis meeting. Any kind of meeting, I think, where you take the time to go to that and you feel like you really want to express your input and that it's really heard, um, it can be so frustrating when you know they're not even paying attention to it. Now, that can be frustrating when it's a Kiwanis meeting, but then just think about it when it's at an IEP meeting for your child. Uh, that can be really, really frustrating that you just feel like everything is laid out. Um, they're just kind of going through the process and they expect parents just to rubber stamp things. Um, and that is so frustrating. And so if that's been happening to you, like what this dad was explaining to me, um, and you want to make sure that that changes and that doesn't happen next year at your IEP meeting. Start thinking this summer, you know, what are some things that I could do to change that up? So, surely, if you've got some ideas about how to make sure um, things aren't predetermined before parents come to meetings, type your, your ideas in the comment box because I'm not the only one here that has some ideas, or if you're a parent on live with us, or even if you're watching the replay, type in your ideas. But I think, you know, so much happens, and it just becomes kind of this pattern of behavior, and special ed teachers have so many IEP meetings that they go to that they have to, you know, prepare for that sometimes that human side of let's make sure we're thinking about this little kid that we're talking about here gets lost in the shuffle. 
So what can be helpful is for you as a parent to ask if there's a way that you can sit down. I think it's best to do with the general ed teacher and the special ed teacher um, because hopefully your child's being included in general ed classrooms and you want that general ed teacher to also be a part of the discussion. But sometimes if you can have almost a pre-meeting um, before the IEP and ask for a copy of the draft IEP, that's a common strategy to use, but sometimes not all parents understand that they don't have to wait till they go to the meeting and get handed this 30 page document. But ask ahead of time, you know, can we sit down with the draft IEP? Can we go through some of these things? The other thing that is super important is to have your own parent report that you want to share. When you go to IEP meetings, how many times do you just hear each professional around the table giving their report? And as a parent, you just are like, well, I don't know, what am I supposed to say? So there are specific things that you want to include in your parent report. Um, you want to talk about your child's strengths and their interests so they know that and know how they can tap into that at school. You need to be able to say what you think are some great goals that your child can work on for the next year. So it doesn't have all those annual goals in the IEP don't have to just come from the staff. Parents should be having input in that. Um, when you look at accommodations, you need to have in your report what accommodations you've seen th that have worked with your child in the past that maybe private therapists are using. What do you do at home that really helps your child? Jot those things down. You can type it up as an official report and ask that all of this information be included in the IEP. Um, so you got to circumvent that kind of predetermination and you've got to get in there with your input and sometimes that's more success you can be more successful if you do that prior to the formal IEP meeting um, so having those ongoing conversations with the staff and not just waiting to once a year when you sit down as an IEP team those can be really helpful and so Shirley, yay, I love, and Eileen joined us. So hey, Eileen, thanks for being here. So Shirley's idea, she says, having the conversations in the summer to make sure the IEP is not forgotten. And then when the teachers come back before school starts, a reminder to the team, having a way to keep the conversations going. Yay, I love that. So, most teachers are still kind of having their teaching brain on during the summer. So, if we can make sure that we, you know, send, I don't know, if, if you want to email or send a gentle reminder of, you know, hope you're having an off, awesome summer, you know, our daughter is looking forward to next year, we're excited. Um, let's get together in August. So it could just be something real short and sweet, but just to remind them, oh yeah, <laughs> this is a family that wants to have some ongoing connection and conversation with the school staff. And then maybe in August, you know, look at the calendar when school starts. Usually teachers are in the building a couple days beforehand. You know, one of the things that you could do is say, hey, I've got some time. My daughter and I would love to come in if you need help putting up bulletin boards or, you know, whatever. All of this is really coming down to getting to know each other. Um, so we're not like at battle all the time and having these heated disagreements at IEP meetings, but that we're, there's that give and take. And then think about how you want to continue, like Shirley said, those ongoing conversations. Some parents, I know a mom um, that I was working with, and she set up monthly meetings with staff, and it was 20 minutes, 
each month were going to sit down and they were really good about keeping it to 20 minutes because teachers are scared. <laughs> it's like, oh no, this parent's coming in. We're going to have another hour long conversation. So keep it to a time that you've agreed upon. For some staff, it's like, no, you know, monthly meetings won't really work for us, but how about if we do, you know, a weekly phone call and it's a 10 minute phone call or whatever. But pick a strategy that's going to be workable for both you as a parent and as the, the staff. And don't always make your conversations just with the special ed teacher. You know, if it's a phone call, make it a conference call and have the general ed teacher on also. We want to be um, empowering general ed teachers that they have ownership of our kids and that our kids are general ed students first. Um, so when you plan these conversations and have your pre-IEP meetings or whatever, make sure that you're always talking to the general ed teacher and the special ed teacher together. So I'm seeing some likes coming across. So we have another comment here. Oh yeah, so Marlo says, I have 20 minute monthly meetings to discuss concerns. So cool. Thank you. And Marlo says, just like Shirley, I call in August to find out when we can come in to meet the teacher and make sure they've read the IEP. I'll ask questions on, and I think she said SDI. I'm not sure what that is, but um, yeah. So coming in, making sure, especially when you're transitioning to a new teacher. Um, one of the things that I did a couple weeks ago was I had a video about making this one pager about your child. So if you want the link to that, just type in one pager in the comment box. But this is something that would be great to take with you in August, especially when it's a new teacher or a new para. So they have a quick way to learn about your child, their strengths, what works, what doesn't work, what kinds of new skills they're working on. So again, just type one pager in there if you'd like um, the link to that video. And I also made a cheat sheet how you can actually um, design that page. And so that would be something that you could also do. So I'm so happy that we're having these conversations today. I'm just checking on my um, phone to see if we have any other comments. And... Let's see. So, yeah, I think the big thing is, like I said, trying to find if it's going to be a phone call, if it's going to be email, some way that you have those ongoing conversations. Um, because, you know, waiting to get a progress report or waiting to your annual IEP just isn't enough for you to touch base and really know what's going on at school. So let's look at our next question. So this one says, we request to see the data the teachers are supposedly collecting and they don't show it to us. What can we do? Well, I know as a parent advisor, Shirley would often say to parents, ask the question or, or the statement, show me the data. Instead of show me the money, our mantra is show me the data. Because you need to know that decisions are being made on some objective, you know, measurement versus the teacher just saying, well, you know, I think he's making good progress in reading. That doesn't really tell you very much. So, if they're not showing you the data, so in your asking for that, you can do a couple different things. One, you can make sure that you've asked for it in writing, because remember what Pete Wright says, if it isn't in writing, it didn't happen. So if you've made verbal requests for data and they don't show it to you, make sure you follow up with an email. That's your paper trail that you want to um, keep going. So ask in an email. You know, you could say, I understand, you know, from reading the IEP that weekly data is being taken on his behavior goals. 
You know, when can we meet to sit down and look at that? Um, because sometimes if they just send you a graph or send you the raw data, it's like, well, this is, this is good, but I don't know what it means. Um, so sometimes it's be careful what you ask for. So you might be able to interpret that data, and that's great if they just send it to you in the email. But if you've got questions about it, again, I think conversations are going to be what's going to be most helpful. So if you've asked for it verbally and you haven't gotten it, if you've sent just kind of an informal email and you still haven't gotten the data, um, you could follow up with a more formal letter requesting your student's education records because that data collection is part of his or her educational records. Um, if you need a letter, I have one that is wonderful that I use. It, ask for 28, <laughs> 28 different things that are all considered educational records. Um, and you can, you know, change that letter to be just the things that you're looking for. Or if you really want to make sure you get all the information, you could use the letter as it is and have that list of 28 different things that you're requesting to, to be able to review. So ask write an email, send a formal record request letter. Those would be the ways that I would suggest um, that you can find out what that data, you know, that they're collecting and, and what it shows. So that's really important because so many times we get progress reports that say like in progress or a number two, which means, you know, they should meet their goal by the end of the, you know, the year. But those kind of progress reports really don't help us very much. So instead, um, I like to see progress reports that, you know, will include some of the data that they've taken and also some notes about, you know, just comments that they've noticed. But I don't want just generic kinds of comments like he seems to be doing well, you know, we, he's a joy to have in reading group. Those kinds of things aren't helpful. So make sure that you ask for specific things that you that you really are looking for. So I'm going to check. So Erica wrote another comment and she said, I also want to share that if you're having a conflict with the school, always write what they said and you said and the date and the time. Keep it in a binder or a notebook. Absolutely. Erica is so good. She has this spiral notebook that she carries with her. And when there's conversations, she makes sure, you know, that she's jotting down what was said, the date, the time. Um, and she just has that as an ongoing record. And it's not like you know, like, oh, I'm going to have to use this, you know, at a later time for some formal, you know, resolution solution or something. But just keeping that notebook, I mean, sometimes that's really helpful. You go back and look and say, ooh, in September we met and we talked about, you know, how it was so hard, you know, as far as the sensory dysregulation. Now I go back in my notebook and I look at December's notes and it's like, wow, look what the OT was able to do. And she brought in these cool fidgets and so writing things down is really helpful when you're having disagreements, but also it's just, you know, it's kind of like a journal. It's a great way to look back and see the progress that your child's made. And Shirley, yeah, Shirley's got a great comment. She says, ask for data for ESY, which is extended school year, especially if it's an automatic no at the IEP meeting. If the IEP meeting is in the fall, how can ESY data be collected for the year? Do not use last year's data for extended school year. Excellent, excellent comment, Shirley. And I have this quick story. I was just, I was at a recent IEP meeting for a kindergartner and her annual review wasn't until September, but we wanted to talk this spring about things and get things in place for first grade. So I'm reading her September 
IEP, and this is, you know, in September, she was a brand new kindergartner, and I look on the page where it says ESY, eligible or not, and no is checked. So I said at the IEP meeting, it's like, so how did you determine in September that this kindergartner wasn't eligible for extended school year? And you know what answer, <laughs> what answer I got? Um, <laughs> The special ed director said, oh, that's a software issue. And I was like, what? <laughs> it's like a software issue? Well, I think the special ed director knew as soon as that came out of her mouth that <laughs> that wasn't going to cut it. So needless to say, we actually had a discussion, which you're supposed to do. It's supposed to be an IEP team decision. We had a discussion and the child does qualify for ESY and she'll be getting that this summer. But what I found out later is this was a new special ed director in the district and the previous special ed director felt like there wasn't funding for extended school year. So they set up the computer program just to default to no for ESY. So no matter who the kid was, what data they had to show regression or recoupment or whatever, the IEP that spit out from the computer, all of them in that district had no checked. So that's not what we want to see happening. And those are those little things that parents need to know to look for because there's so many pages to that IEP and a lot of times extended school year just gets kind of lost and doesn't even get talked about. So thanks Shirley, that's a great idea. Yeah, we, we want to be doing that for sure. So Chris Shriver, Chris Shriver is here. How exciting is that? This is kind of like a reunion. Chris was <laughs> the best man at our wedding, so I'm going to say, hey, sh hey, Chris. Um, and so, yeah, so you just never know who's going to join you on a Facebook Live show, right? So thanks for being here. Um, and let's go. We've got, I think, a couple more questions. So let's look at the next question. Um, so this I heard a parent typed this in recently for me to respond to on today's show, but I hear this a lot, and it's how do I get more one-on-one -on -one time for my child? So this is when a parent is requesting additional time from um, usually a paraeducator to provide, you know, specific one-to-one -one time for their child. So this is another time where I say, be careful what you ask for, because not in all situations is it a good idea for your child to have a one-on-one -on -one person working with them. So it depends on how things are set up. What I see too often is a paraeducator is almost Velcroed to your child's side, and that's not going to be helpful. You know, I see pairs in the classroom and they'll have a chair sitting, you know, right next to the student's desk. And it's like, you know, I have to be here. This is my job. I have to always be next to this child. And that's not helping. <laughs> so instead, if there's a pair that's needed for some extra support, what I think works so much better is if the pair can be assigned to the teacher. And it's Mrs. Johnson's paraeducator that's going to help everybody in the class, not just one child. Um, because the reality is when you're a classroom teacher, like when I was a first and second grade teacher, and you have 29 kids, there's more than just those couple kids and IEPs that need extra help. So that para should be wandering and and working with a variety of kids. Now, if there's a specific issue about why your child needs a one-on-one -on -one aid, that's what I think the IEP team needs to talk about. So I don't want parents just to come in there demanding a one-on-one -on -one aid and you know making this huge deal out of it 
before we even have an idea of what is this person needed for. So instead, as a parent, if you can go to the IEP team meeting and say, you know, my, my child is struggling, you know, we've been working on potty training, but there's certain times during the day that she really needs some extra adult support. So then it's like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. So let's look at, you know, who can be that one person. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a nurse, maybe it's somebody else in the building that's going to provide that adult assistance in the bathroom. But that doesn't mean that that adult has to be with your daughter, you know, for the whole seven, eight hours of the school day. Or I've seen examples where parents are really scared and they have a right to be when they see the playground and there's a fence for three sides of the playground and maybe not the fourth. And they're like, ah, my child will, as soon as they see an opening, they'll take off and be who knows where in the neighborhood. So I really need, or my child needs, to have extra adult supervision at recess time. Well, that makes sense. Okay, so let's figure out who else can be on recess duty and one of their main jobs is to make sure that they have that child in their line of sight all the time. So if something does happen, they can be over there in a second to help them. But that doesn't mean your child needs this person to be Velcro to them for the whole day. Um, when kids have adults always with them, it is so hard for your child to make any kind of friendship. I mean, especially as they get older in upper elementary or middle school, and for sure high school. I mean, other kids aren't gonna wanna come up and have a conversation when there's this adult standing there all the time. So yes, there are times when your child might need um, some one-to-one -one support for very specific things during the day and then talk about what that goal looks like, what the time period would look like versus just saying my child needs his own one-on-one -on -one all day at school. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, and I'm gonna check here and see if we have any other comments or questions. So I'm excited you guys were here with us today. It's almost been an hour, so unless there's another question, I think what we're going to do is um, kind of wind up our show here. I, again, I want to thank you for being here. If you had friends that couldn't be with us live, tell them that the replay will be up on my Facebook page. I also download it to my YouTube channel, Collaborative Special Education Advocacy, so you can see all my videos over there. Um, and next week, next Thursday, I'm hoping that we have an advocate from the state of Maine to come on and talk about restraint and seclusion. Um, unfortunately, I've had several families I've worked with this year that have had uh, very, um, I don't know, harmful experiences of their kids being restrained and secluded and so-called calm rooms or timeout rooms. And so there's an advocate in Maine that has a lot of experience with restraint and seclusion cases. So I'm working with her to confirm the logistics, but hopefully she'll be on with us next week. Um, the other thing I'm doing as my summer project is I'm working on a five day challenge for parents. It's gonna be a fun, way for us to up our advocacy skills and, and get ready for the fall. So keep listening and make sure you like my Visions and Voices Facebook page because when the five day challenge comes out, I'll be announcing it there on my Facebook page. So thanks for being here today. I'm just like so thrilled that there's so many parents out there that are just doing awesome advocacy work for their children and it just it just makes me very happy and it's very rewarding that I know that kids 
are getting more of the education that they deserve because you, the parent, are out there making it happen. So until next Thursday, noon at Mountain Time, take care and keep on keeping on.